Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Lori Laidlaw Ralston. I'm a board member of the Greater Cleveland Chapter of the American Red Cross and a member of the board here at the City Club. It's great to see so many supporters and partners of both organizations here today. Though we seldom think about it in Northeast Ohio, we have already begun an uncharacteristically early hurricane season. Just this week, the National Weather Service recorded a new record with a second Category 4 storm logged before July. These two storms didn't cause a great deal of damage, but they are a reminder of events that are still strong memories for us. Rita and Katrina on the Gulf Coast in 2005 and 2012's Hurricane Sandy, which decimated the East Coast and left many of us without power for a week here in Cleveland. If you think back to 2005, however, you'll remember how many people were displaced from New Orleans. And though much of the coverage focused on the Houston Astrodome, Cleveland welcomed hundreds of displaced families and individuals. A key partner in the effort was the American Red Cross. Since its founding by Clara Barton in 1881, the Red Cross has been synonymous with disaster relief. Originally established as a wartime relief effort for more than 100 years now, the Red Cross has been providing peacetime disaster relief in addition to support for members of the military and their families, health education, and of course, blood collection, processing, and distribution. Given the vital role that the Red Cross plays in our communities, it's our great pleasure today to welcome the CEO of the American Red Cross, Gail McGovern. Frankly, it's a little intimidating being up here, but I asked to do Gail's introduction for two reasons. First, I love Gail McGovern. <laughs> I really do. She is at once one of the kindest people I know and one of the smartest. Second, almost two years ago, I received a life-saving transfusion of blood at the Cleveland Clinic. When I arrived after being jet vacked in, thanks to the Red Cross, the blood that I needed was waiting for me there. Ms. McGovern joined the American Red Cross as president and CEO on April 8, 2008. She is one of that admirable group of citizens who translate their private sector success to public service in the not-for-profit world. Prior to joining the Red Cross, she was a faculty member at the Harvard Business School and served as president of Fidelity Personal Investments with roughly half a trillion dollars of assets under management. She was also executive vice president for the Consumer Market Division at AT&T. Gail has been a remarkable CEO. In the, fast, in the last five years, the Red Cross has eliminated its operating deficit and has begun to deliver a modest annual surplus. Gail has also initiated extensive modernization projects at the Red Cross, but we know her because she led the response to multiple high-profile disasters, including the Haiti earthquake, Japan earthquake and tsunami, the record-breaking tornadoes, floods, and wildfires that affected the U.S. in 2011, and as I mentioned earlier, Hurricane Sandy. What her official bio does not capture is Gail's ability to build relationships across levels of organizations. She has an unparalleled capacity to connect with anyone on a human level, particularly as they encounter disaster. She is also a great storyteller who can make people laugh and cry all within the span of moments. I am honored to call Gail McGovern my friend, particularly as we work together to lift people up in their darkest hours in their time of need. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gail McGovern. Boy, I love you too. <laughs> You're so awesome. And I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Here we go. Thank you. 
Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon, and uh, lots of thanks to the City Club of Cleveland for having me here today and for your wonderful hospitality. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk to you about our life-saving mission at the American Red Cross and also talk to you about the transformation that we're undergoing to make sure that we fulfill our mission as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Our nation hasn't faced a mega, mega disaster like Hurricane Sandy through 2013 and so far this year, thank goodness. But the fact is we have been incredibly busy at the American Red Cross over the last year and a half. And that's because of the incredible increase in the number of disasters. In last April, we responded to the terrible tragedy that occurred in Boston during the Boston Marathon. And I see a number of you nodding your heads. Um, that same week, we had a massive explosion in a fertilizer plant in the small town of West Texas that was terrible, and there was loss of life there. A month later, we responded to the tornadoes that ripped through Oklahoma and also ripped through Texas. And throughout the summer, there were wildfires that were rampant throughout the West and caused a lot of damage out there, too. And they also had a lot of flooding. This past winter, which just felt like it was never going to end, <laughs> there were so many severe storms, ice storms, snow storms, and these crippled communities around the country and left tens of thousands of people without electricity and without power and in need of temporary shelter and in need of care. And we also are still continuing to play a very active role in the Philippines because of the typhoon that impacted that country so terribly. About a month ago, there was a whole spate of tornadoes that came through the south in addition to flooding. And at one point, we actually had operations in 14 states all going at the same time. And of course, I know that Ohio is no stranger to disasters either. Last month, there were severe storms that caused a lot of flooding in the region. And Lorraine, Medina, Cuyahoga, and Summit counties were those that were some of the hardest hit. In fact, the flooding was so terrible that in our shelter were families that actually had to be rescued from their homes by boat. It was quite stunning. But thanks to the compassion and the generosity of our remarkable donors, the American Red Cross was able to be there. And they were able to give relief, they were able to give comfort, and they were able to give hope. We opened up a shelter in Lorraine County, and for the first three nights of the storm, that shelter stayed open. And then right after that, when the storms cleared, in partnership with the Salvation Army, we took our emergency response vehicles and drove in and out of neighborhoods delivering hot meals and a lot of supplies to help people deal with their disaster. In total, just those floods that I described, we gave out more than 1,500 meals and snacks and more than 2,000 relief items. These are things like comfort kits that have hygiene items in them, uh, mops, buckets, uh, bleach, things that people need to basically muck out of their homes after a flood. And it's during disasters like these that I am so grateful for our outstanding leadership, for our volunteers, and for our employees. They always step up. And Mary Alice Frank, who is here, Mary Alice, why don't you stand up? She leads the Northeast Ohio region, and she and her dedicated staff and volunteers are there to answer the call so many different times and on different occasions. And they not only have responded to disasters here, but they go around the country when needed. And I truly believe that this community is so very fortunate to have Mary Alice at the helm in the Northeast Ohio region. So we so appreciate your leadership. Of all the disasters that I mentioned already aren't the only disasters that we responded to. In fact, we respond to 70,000 disasters every single year. 
I mean, it's really amazing. Um, this includes everything from massive flooding to wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, to tens of thousands of single family house fires or local flooding or a water main break. And these are too small to make it to the evening news, but these small disasters are absolutely catastrophic to a family that's impacted by one. To them, it feels just like a category four hurricane. And we are there, we provide food, we provide shelter, we provide comfort, we provide care. In the past year, the Red Cross assisted more than 3,900 families just in Northeast Ohio that were impacted by these seemingly small disasters. And disaster response is just one part of our mission. The fact is that one in five people in our country have been touched by the American Red Cross but it's actually very unusual for me to meet anybody that truly understands the depth and breadth of everything that the Red Cross does. The Red Cross provides 40% of our nation's blood supply, and every single one of those donations, 8 million products that we shipped just in the last year alone, each one comes from the arm of a generous person who literally opens up their veins to save the life of a complete stranger. It is such an act of generosity. In your state, the Red Cross distributes about half a million units every year to 133 different hospitals. It's pretty extraordinary. And I know David Plate is here, but I didn't see him. There he is. Why don't you stand up, David? I didn't see where you were sitting. David is the CEO of the Northern Ohio region, and David has served the American Red Cross for 21 years in this capacity. And in that time, the region collected 4.3 million units of blood, and that produced almost 10 million blood products. So thank you, David, for your service and your leadership. We really appreciate it. We also work with members of the military, veterans, and their families by providing about 350,000 emergency connections every single year. And this can be anything from delivering the news of a tragedy to somebody who is deployed overseas, to something joyous like delivering the news of the birth of a new child and getting that serviceman home so that he can witness it. We have volunteers on every single military base, not just in the US, but abroad. We have volunteers in theater. We have volunteers right now in Afghanistan, and we just recently brought our volunteers home from Iraq. And they do anything from running canteens to being morale officers. Um, they set up cyber cafes. I had the privilege of seeing a video, a Skype video, from one of our cyber cafes. It was a man who was deployed in Iraq, and he was communicating with his teenage son, and he was teaching his teenage son how to shave for the very first time. We also teach life-saving skills to about seven million people every single year, and I get to recognize ordinary people that have just done the most extraordinary acts to save a life. And these everyday heroes come from all across our country. For example, an event like that occurred just this last December here in Cleveland at the Morrison Products Manufacturing Facility. A woman named Kathy Kuhn and three of her colleagues used their Red Cross CPR training to save the life of one of their co-workers, John Pillar. John suffered a massive heart attack at work. And luckily, 25 of the employees in that facility had received first aid and CPR training by the Red Cross while they were at work. So Kathy and her coworkers knew that they had to call 911 and they knew how to properly connect the automatic electronic defibrillator machine. They connected that AED to John, gave him a shock, revived him, then proceeded to provide CPR. And because of their quick action, John survived the heart attack and he has now returned to work 
from that experience, which is quite extraordinary. And Kathy and her co-workers were recognized for their heroic efforts by receiving the Red Cross Lifesaver Award. The American Red Cross also helps people internationally. We're in 77 different countries, and we provide disaster response and also preparedness across the globe. And we also are involved in disease prevention. We have a partnership with the UN Foundation, UNICEF, World Health Organization, and CDC, and the American Red Cross. And together, we have vaccinated over one billion children against the measles. And our collective goal is to stamp out this disease. It's hard for me to believe, but this month actually does mark my sixth anniversary with the American Red Cross. And when I first started in June of 2008, the Red Cross was indeed facing a number of challenges. We did have an operating deficit, as Laurie mentioned. It was $209 million. And we had a mandate from our Board of Governors to close that deficit within two years. We also had incurred a mountain of debt. We actually owed $612 million to various banks. Our biomedical services operations had some quality control issues. Our fundraising was not keeping up with the pace of our expenses. And our Red Cross brand, which is so beloved, needed a little bit of a facelift to appeal to a new generation. And we had a ton of duplications for, throughout our chapter network. Each of our 700 chapters had their own email systems, their own payroll systems, their own finance systems, their own treasury, their own bank accounts. You get the picture. We even had 700 different websites, one for each chapter. So if you tried to type in donate blood or disaster relief in Google search, most of the time we didn't even come up because we were so fragmented. So in the months after I started, our leadership team decided to draw on the capabilities of 50 of our best chapter execs to be able to figure out how we were going to restructure the American Red Cross. And Mary Alice Frank was part of that team, a very instrumental member of that team. And they selflessly came up with a complete plan to restructure and realign our chapter network. And they came together as one Red Cross in a spirit of teamwork and in a spirit of unity. And we knew we had to cut costs, while at the same time we had to be 100% focused on fulfilling our mission, because the nation really depends on us. So we had to make some very tough financial decisions, particularly in the early years, including freezing our pension plan, temporarily suspending merit increases, and temporarily suspending our uh, 401k match. We consolidated all of our back office functions, including finance, HR, payroll, and this really did cut a lot of costs and improved our efficiencies. All of these changes truly did pay off, and we've made such great strides since we began on this journey. In two years, we had eliminated that operating deficit, and since then, we finished the last four of the last fiscal years three of the four last fiscal years with a modest surplus. And we're continuing to pay down our debt. I could not be more proud of the American Red Crossers, from our donors to our volunteers to our staff. Everyone stepped up and did their part to make this happen. And they made this financial turnaround a reality. I'm not exaggerating when I say that their hard work their sense of teamwork and their commitment to our mission really did literally save the American Red Cross. We also moved greater responsibility for fundraising out into our chapters, and they are becoming world class at it. Our biomedical services unit made amazing strides in the area of regulatory compliance. And based on our conversations with the FDA, we believe that we are now leading the industry in our management of recall blood products. In recent years, we moved to one email system, one volunteer management system, a common donor database, and we have one website, redcross.org. <laughs> this was 
such a massive effort to transform our IT. And for those of you that have lived with legacy IT systems, I know you can feel our pain. It was like we were attempting to complete 700 mergers all at the same time. It, it was quite an effort. We also revitalized our brand with an aggressive push on social media and also on mobile apps. These apps, which have anything from first aid to what you do in a hurricane or an earthquake or a tornado, we launched a, a slew of these free apps. They have been downloaded more than four and a half million times. And when you read the reviews in the app stores, they are saving lives. The very first day we launched the very first one, the very first review said, I just saved my grandmother from choking using my iPhone. So we know these apps are continually saving lives. We have 1.3 million followers now on Twitter. And I'm really proud of the fact that with all of this work, we were still able to keep our overhead low. On average, 91 cents of every dollar that's donated to the Red Cross goes directly to the services that we provide. We also recently put in a new strategy that strengthens our disaster services operation. In the past, headquarters would swoop in if a disaster was too big for a single chapter to be able to handle. Now our goal is to put the chapter executive in charge of the disaster. That way we increase the number of our local volunteers, our resources that are local, and we only send in national resources if the chapter exec asks us to. Our chapter execs like Ma Mary Alice here in Cleveland, they know their area, they know their community, they know the other relief agencies on the ground. They also know local government officials. And Mary Alice is the best person to make decisions about her community, not somebody that lives 400 miles away in Washington, D.C. We believe that our focus on the local level allows us to better meet the needs of the American public, our partners, and our volunteers. And we got to test many of these principles during the tornado that swept through Moore, Oklahoma. I'm sure you remember that tornado. It was devastating. There was loss of life. Some of the lives that were lost were children. And in the days and weeks after that tornado, we had deployed 2,000 workers to Moore, Oklahoma. 91% of them were volunteers. And that's how we get to keep our overhead low, by using volunteers. But this time we put the chapter exec in charge of that disaster. So 65% of those volunteers came right from Moore and the surrounding communities. And it was a beautiful thing, seeing neighbors helping neighbors, the volunteers coming right from that community. Now, since the Oklahoma City chapter was subsumed by the tornado response, the neighboring Tulsa, Oklahoma chapter jumped in their cars, drove over to Oklahoma City, and they basically said, we are going to take over all of your local disasters while you respond to the tornado. Um, that kind of teamwork would not have taken place in our old structure. And it is a great example of teamwork, but it's also a way to stretch our donors' dollars. Um, we are able to cut back on travel, we're able to cut back on lodging costs because the volunteers came from a local area. So the Red Cross has successfully transformed our chapter network and our disaster response operations, but now we are set facing a whole new set of financial challenges. I don't know if any of you have ever watched Saturday Night Live, particularly the original cast. Do you remember Roseanne, Rosanna Dana? <laughs> it's always something. <laughs> so I like to call what we are dealing with now, turn around to the sequel. And we are forced, because of these new financial challenges, to completely re-engineer the rest of all of our operations. And what's driving this is actually a good thing. And that is that the demand, the overall demand for blood products is beginning to decline. And we've seen it decline fairly dramatically in the last two years. So for example, medical treatments, this is caused by a number of factors. So medical treatments have advanced, and now a lot of these treatments are, are bloodless surgeries, like arthroscopic surgeries or minimally invasive surgeries, and they don't require blood transfusions. But we also have learned that hospitals were actually wasting blood. 
Whenever an operating unit was in use, two units of blood were called to go into that operating room. And if the blood wasn't used, the blood was tossed. And a number of these operating rooms are being used for small, non-invasive surgeries. So now what the hospitals are doing is they're bringing the blood in refrigerated units, and if the blood isn't used, it's being put back in inventory. Now, as a humanitarian, these are they're, these are just wonderful developments. They're, they're, it's wonderful that medicine has advanced this way. It's great for our blood donors because we don't want to waste a single drop of their blood. It's great for patients because these non-invasive procedures reduces risk. And it's great for the community when hospitals are being more judicious with blood because it's going to lower the cost of health care. But I have to say that when you're running a blood business, a, de a decline of this magnitude, is you're going to feel it. And it's being felt throughout the entire industry. So in response to these changing market conditions, we're working to right size and restructure our blood operations. And my leadership team and I believe that the current changes in the blood industry have presented us with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to relook at the entire blood operations. I think it was Rahm Emanuel who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> Although someone pointed out that they thought he ripped that off from uh, Winston Churchill. But nevertheless, <laughs> they're very, very wise words. So in, in, in addition to just adjusting our capacity to the new level of demand, we're also looking at how we handle blood donors, how we handle hospitals, and every single process in between to make it more effective and more efficient. The good news is we've already removed millions of dollars in cost in our blood operations while still maintaining and actually improving the quality of our blood. And we've identified a number of additional savings moving forward through consolidations, restructuring, and other techniques like that. So while changes of this magnitude are difficult to live through, we know we have to address these challenges head on in order to fulfill our mission. And as we look forward to, and we look forward to continuing to provide this community and all the surrounding areas with our blood products in the months and years to come. Now, before I continue, I need to ask you all, how many of you have ever donated blood? Raise your hand. Oh, my goodness gracious. Thank you so, so very much. Now, here's the thing. Please, I implore you, do not stop donating blood. Do not stop donating blood. Because in our most conservative estimates of where blood demand is, is going to uh, approach, we need 15,000 donations a day. That's 550 blood drives a day. The need is constant, particularly during the summer months. So please, if you haven't donated in a while, um, we would really appreciate your blood donations. Now, speaking of blood donors and even speaking of financial donors, every single thing that we do is possible because of the generosity of our donors. We are not a government agency. And time and time again, our remarkable donors step up and help out whenever there's a need. And with this outpouring of support also comes a responsibility for accountability and transparency. Our financial donors have every right to ask us how we're using their hard-earned dollars. And they have every right to ask those questions, and we have to answer them promptly with transparency and with integrity. And it doesn't matter if these questions are coming from the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or from a young philanthropist. And I learned this lesson firsthand right after the earthquake struck Haiti. So I received a check for $400 from a fourth grade class in Dedham, Massachusetts. And they put a note in the, the letter saying, this is for the people of Haiti, and could you please come to our class and thank us? So <laughs> I said, well, I don't think I'm going to be in Dedham, Massachusetts in the very near future, but would you like to do a Skype connection and I can thank you that way? So they said yes, and I got myself all prepared for this class, and there were nine-year-olds, so I figured, you know, this isn't going to be very hard. 
So I had a map of Hispaniola so I could tell them where Haiti was. And uh, I had a little lecture on seismology so they would know what an earthquake was. And before I could open up my mouth, these nine-year-olds started hitting me with questions that by the end of the Skype interview, my deodorant had broken down. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Where is the money? How do we know we're getting it to Haiti? How much food can it buy? Are you going to use it to buy water? I, I knew we had entered into a new era of philanthropy after that particular experience. And I have to tell you, I answered every one of their questions. I believe I assured them that we were spending their money wisely. But I, you should know that whenever I make decisions, I'm sitting in a conference room and I visualize that fourth grade class <laughs> sitting in there with me. And I visualize the CEO of the Fortune 500 company, who also asked me a lot of tough questions, sitting in there with me. And I ask myself, would they approve of what we are doing? And would they approve of the fact that this is helping the people that we serve? We welcome this level of openness. We welcome this level of accountability. And I'm proud to share our decisions with their donors. So before I stop and take your questions, I did want to offer a personal perspective of my experiences leading this amazing organization. When I started at the American Red Cross, I really didn't know what to expect. And frankly, I signed up for the role because of the leadership challenge, because of the intellectual challenge. And since then, I have witnessed some of the scenes of such unimaginable heartbreak and destruction. The images of places like Japan after the tsunami, Haiti after the earthquake, the mid-Atlantic states after the hurricane, all of these tornadoes, floods, disaster after disaster after disaster. These are images that unfortunately are going to stay with me forever. But I also get to see the very best that our country has to offer. And because of that, I am thankful that I am in this role and I think I have the best job in the entire world. I get to personally experience the amazing generosity of our donors and the incredible resiliency of the American public. I see that time and time again. About two years ago, I stood at the graduation in Joplin, Missouri, after the tornado had struck the year before. And these high school kids had graduated on time. Their, this community was demolished. All the businesses, homes, community centers, giant hospital is gone. The school is completely gone. <clears throat> these kids graduated from a makeshift high school in a, in a strip mall. And this class distinguished itself in so many ways. They were the strongest graduating class from Joplin that the school had ever experienced. Just last month, I toured the affected areas in Arkansas after tornadoes had ripped through. <clears throat> and visiting one neighborhood, I met a woman who her, she and her family had built a safe room. So all six of them huddled in the safe room when the tornado sirens went off. When they came out, everything was gone. Their home was smashed to smithereens. And this woman could not stop smiling. She kept saying, I'm alive, I'm alive. She said, when I walked out of the safe room, the first thing that struck me was that she had lost some mementos that her mother had left her. And her mother had just recently passed away. And she took a few steps and then looked down the ground. And there on the ground, completely intact, was her mother's brooch. And she turned to me and she said, angels put that brooch there. And she said, my family is fine, I'm fine. It was really quite amazing. I met a young man who was in the process of getting married up on Pinnacle Mountain. And so the whole wedding party, all the guests, the family, they're up on top of this mountain. They have the ceremony, and the reception is supposed to take place in his house. He gets down to the house, it's gone. And when I was talking to him, he was just standing in the midst of all this rubble. And I said, are you OK? And he said, you know, I didn't get to carry my bride over the threshold, but he said, I'm OK. Everyone I know is OK because they're up on top of the mountain. And he said, I'm going to build back my home right here on this spot. I mean, that was such an example of resiliency. I met a man who lost his dog, big chocolate lab. And he found the dog 
up in a tree. And I can assure you, this dog did not climb up <laughs> on that tree. I, this is the crazy thing about tornadoes. I mean, everything gets lifted up. You see washing machines hanging off of trees. You see cars on top of buildings. And this dog was up in the tree. Well, the fire department rescued his dog. The dog was fine. I said to him, are you OK? He said, you know what? My family's fine. My friends are fine. My dog's OK. I'm OK. It's really quite amazing. So I met so many people in Arkansas that all had their own strange story. But the one thing they all had in common was the resiliency and the strength to build back. Another great thing about my job is people see my Red Cross pin and they just come up to me and tell me their Red Cross story. I met a man who donated 103 gallons of blood. And when I said to him, that is so stunning. You know, why do you do it? He said, I do it because it's the right thing to do. And I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a difference. It was amazing. Um, I also, last summer, was giving a speech at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. And the AV technician came up and was miking me up. And he said, you saved me from despair when I was serving in the Navy. And I said, tell me your story. And he opened up his mouth, and he's about to speak. And he got so choked up. He stopped. He just gave me this beautiful smile, threw his arms around me, gave me a hug, and walked off the stage. It's stories like that that make my job worthwhile. And people need us more now than ever. The number of natural disasters is on the rise. More and more of our brave men and women are coming home from deployment in the military. And they are having a tough time reacclimating to civilian life. And our emergency connection lines are ringing even more now than when they were deployed. Our blood products and our health and safety courses are saving lives every single day. And today, we're more prepared to meet these challenges than ever before. But there's always more that we can do. And we'd be delighted to get you all involved in our life-saving mission. There's so many opportunities to do so, um, whether it's volunteering your time, donating blood, getting engaged with our local board, or making a financial donation. Um, the need is tremendous, and we can always use help. So I'd like to thank the City Club once again for having me here. It's a great privilege, and you've been a very gracious audience. So I thank all of you, and I'd be delighted to take any of your questions. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum with Gail McGovern, CEO of the American Red Cross. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and, jo and those joining us through our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, 104.9 WCLV, and WVIZ PBS IdeaStream or on one of the many other radio stations across the country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Next Friday, June 27, the City Club welcomes Tom Farrell, CEO of Dominion. For more information and reservations about any of our upcoming or past forums, Visit, visit us online at cityclub.org. Today, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the American Red Cross and Teaching Cleveland. Thank you for your support. Now, we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are marketing and outreach specialist, Kirsten Pianca, and City Club intern, Spencer Kiesel. First question, please. <clears throat> Ms. Gurren, thank you for coming to Cleveland as a board member of the local chapter. And I want to thank Mary Alice for her service in this chapter. My question for you is, um, from your perspective, what is the ratio of increase in the disaster or the intensity of the disaster over the last few years? Because you have a much better idea of what it used to be and what you are seeing now. So we've taken a look at this and plotted it around the entire globe. 
and as far back as 20 years. And it's actually growing exponentially. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of debate as to why. I'm not a scientist, so I, I don't know the answer to that. It's also possible that with media and with m better eyes around the globe, that we're more aware of disasters that we might not have been before. But the intensity is increasing. The number is increasing. But fortunately, the deaths are decreasing each year in total. And that's because we do a lot in the area of getting people prepared. Even in uh, far-flung parts of the world, we're helping people learn about disaster preparedness and how to respond from a disaster. But there's no doubt about it, it's increasing. Thank you very much for coming to Cleveland. I'm a board member of one of the local chapters as well as a national disaster responder. Thank you. I wonder if you would talk about your vision for volunteer leadership, uh, particularly at the local level, at the community chapter level, and within the disaster services? So I, I love this question because we have a real full court press on recruiting and galvanizing more volunteer leaders in areas where we don't have locations. You know, I, my vision is that we have, you know, close to a thousand new places where we have volunteer leaders who can engage other volunteers, can help us identify people that we can train to respond to disasters, to teach our courses, to be ambassadors for blood drives, um, that very much of our future is reliant on volunteers and not just ones that, that run into a, a disaster, but people that are there in the community all the time talking about our mission, helping people get prepared, helping to av uh, avoid disasters, not just respond to them. So it's, it's essential. So anyone in this audience that wants to get engaged as a volunteer, we are all ears because that is what is going to be our greatest strength. We're a grassroots organization. We need to be in all the communities, and we would love your help to be able to do that. And thank you for volunteering on the board and for being a disaster responder as well. Thanks. Could you briefly describe the differences and functions of uh, the Red Cross and FEMA in a national disaster situation? Oh, this is a great question. So um, FEMA has become such an integral and important partner for the American Red Cross. They are doing a phenomenal job. Um, they have gotten so much faster at distributing um, financial assistance to individuals on the ground. And as a result, um, since they're doing that quicker, it helps us be able to help people during the recovery phase. Um, they, they, we share lists. They point out people that need additional help than beyond what uh, they can provide. Um, we are, there's no light between our shoulders during a disaster. Um, we were partnered together during um, Hurricane Sandy, and I don't think either organization could have been able to do what we accomplished without the other. So they do assessments of communities. They figure out who qualifies for assistance. And uh, they gave out over a billion dollars in the first two weeks after that hurricane hit. So people could bridge their existence and stay in hotels, et cetera. A great partner of ours. And as I said, we sit down and look at the community, community by community, and convene all of the relief agencies to figure out how and who can help the community the best. Um, and so uh, particularly of late, there's very little duplication of function. Um, they sit in our disaster operations center. We have people sitting in their disaster operations centers. Uh, it's been a great partnership. We're really fortunate. Uh, this question relates to the economics of uh, providing for the wonderful programs that you outlined today. Uh, during the past few years, uh, the federal government has made significant reductions in the amount of money that it makes available for its uh, various agencies that it supports. To what extent has the American Red Cross been hurt by that? 
and uh, roughly uh, how many millions of dollars each year uh, does the uh, federal government uh, provide the American Red Cross? And what percentage, roughly, is that of your entire budget? So I love this question, and it's going to surprise you. So the cutbacks, we haven't felt them um, because we don't get very much money from the federal government. Uh, we have a $3 billion operating budget. Two billion of it is for providing um, health, uh, providing uh, blood services to hospitals. Those services are priced at cost, so we pretty much break even on that part. The rest is all because of the generosity of our financial donors, and the only government funding, federal government funding that we get is for some of the work we do for the services to armed forces. They help offset the cost of us doing those emergency connections that I described. It's $24 million on a $3 billion base, so it's less than 1%. Um, as I said, we're not a government agency, but interestingly enough, 22% of the American population does think we're a government agency. Um, so spread the word. We don't get a lot of funding. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that answered your question. Ms. McGovern, uh, perhaps the Red Cross doesn't have enough to do, uh, <laughs> but under the heading a pound of pre uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, particularly in floods. With your experience, the your database should indicate where there are repeated floods. Is there any effort in the Red Cross, either uh, by itself or in coordination with other agencies, to identify these places and prevent rebuilding in the area that's just going to get flooded out again? So um, it's also a great question. Um, and, and you're right, we have a lot on our plate. Um, what we do have is techniques that people can use to prepare for a flood. And also, we send out um, uh, alarms to tell them when the area is in danger of flooding. We've sent out about 125 million weather alerts on the apps that I described. So we really do try to get people out of harm's way. Um, I don't think we can embrace the mission of a group like the Army Corps of Engineers, but we are very cognizant of where those water tables are, where those floods usually take place. There is a flooding season. There are certain rivers that flood. And um, I know that some of the money that was part of Sandy Relief is going to be shoring up some of the seawalls and some of the river beds that um, are prone to flooding. But um, you're absolutely right. We know where it's going to happen. And 80% of the US population now is living near water within 50 miles of water. So it's, it's going to happen a lot. Um, and there, there are things that we can do, but it's a massive undertaking um, for, on the part of government, local, state, and federal government to shore up those, those places. And they're building codes. Now um, people that want to rebuild in the area that was impacted by Sandy have to build up on higher ground. So a lot of it is building code regulation. Um, and these are steps that are taking place and have to, have to occur. You have a big enough donor base so that statistical patterns probably emerge. Who are your donors? And do you have any sense of what you need to do to make sure that a generation from now, you have a new generation of donors? This is such a great question. So I like to think of ourselves as um, America's charity. Uh, just to, who are donors? So many people give to the American Red Cross. Um, we get about $650 million of donations in every year, and the average donation size is $85. And that gives you a sense. Um, we, do, we look at how we're perceived amongst the American public, and we break that down by demographics, age, etc. cetera. Um, we have a favorability score of 70% among the American public. Um, and when you say 70% Washington, D.C. favorability score, everybody is in awe. It is the, <laughs> it is the highest um, uh, number that we track of the other charities. But here's the interesting 
um, point that's relevant to your question, um, when we look at youth, it's 85% favorability. I mean, and a lot of it is because we've gotten mobile, we've gotten social, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus. I mean, so we're appealing to them in a way that uh, is different than we appeal to other donors. So, you know, I, I have great optimism that the young people today are going to become tomorrow's philanthropists. And we can engage them in volunteer opportunities when they're young, you know, setting up a, a club in their university when they get older, um, donating blood when they get older, um, and then when they become young professionals, starting to donate financially, et cetera. We couldn't do this before we had a common donor database because what would happen is the donor would leave you know, a community and we couldn't figure out where they went. So one of the things that we're doing to address the concern that you raised is following our donors throughout um, their lifetime and do life cycle management of our individual donors and figure out how to keep them engaged um, all the way um, to the end of time. Hi, my name is Charlie McGee. I'm a volunteer. Um, I've been volunteering for the past two decades. Thank you. The, um, I've heard you use the surplus word a lot in your conversation today. Do you see any um, immediate reallocation of those funds into uh, some of the chapters that have had to close because, uh, due to lack of funding and resources? A so, more, a more okay. specific question, um, the National Disaster Operations Center. You know, you consolidated a lot of jobs there. Uh, so a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, we have not closed down chapters because of lack of funding. We have consolidated locations because we're trying to be very mindful of our overhead. But there are chapters and communities that are not going to be able to raise the funds that they need. And that's why we have a disaster relief fund to offset some of those expenses. So. You know, the communities that need us the most um, often are the communities with the poorest demographics. So we make sure that those chapters get the funds that they need to be able to fulfill their, their mission. Um, I wish we had a huge surplus, particularly with the um, challenges that we have with our blood services at this point. But we will not close down chapters because they're not raising enough money. What we did in um, our national headquarters organization is we moved a lot of people that were in Washington, D.C. out into the chapter network so they could be on the ground responding to disasters. So in fact, um, the number of uh, d disaster responders on our staff actually is higher than it was before we began re-engineering our disaster operations. And, um, you know, having sat in our disaster operations centers during disasters, you know, most of what we were doing was calling the chapters to find out how it was going out there. And now they're in charge of it. And they're calling us and telling us how it's going out there and asking for more resources that they could potentially need. So um, thank you for the question. And thank you for two decades of volunteering. I really appreciate it. Gail, thank you so much for joining us at the City Club today. Um, you mentioned the blood services work that you do, and you also mentioned that that's about two-thirds of your $3 billion operating budget. And I think there's been some press coverage in recent years about sort of what the reimbursement costs are for a pint of blood. And you and I spoke about that prior to the event. And I wonder if you could unpack that number a little bit, because it is a surprising number to people who don't know much about blood services work. So another great question. So the interesting thing about blood and I had the same question when I showed up I said gee you just take it out of here and you put it in there you know what's what's so hard about that and you go to one of our blood services operation and there is a lot that has to happen between the arm and the hospital distribution I mean, first of all we have to test the the blood and we test for a whole host of diseases I mean, the, the amazing thing is part of the reason the blood supply is safe is because we can test for Chagas, Dengue, uh, HIV AIDS, Hep C. I mean, you pretty much almost get a complete medical workup from your, your blood when you donate, and we can figure out how that blood is. But the testing takes a long time. Then there's manufacturing. Each one of the units that is donated 
generally gets broken up into three units, platelets, plasma, and also red blood cells. And so there are all kinds of machinery and centrifugal machines, and you know, so it goes from collections, testing, then manufacturing. Once it's manufactured, this is probably the most classic example of just-in-time inventory I can think of because some of those products only last five days. So the distribution network is very complicated and we need distribution hubs all over the place to get a steady stream of blood into our hospitals um, that, that continues going forward. We are very, very conservative with our testing. So if there's the slightest bit of question, there's recall products also. So all of this along the supply chain, you know, it, it costs money. And you know, as a result, we try to price it just about where it needs to be at cost. And um, we work with hospitals in, in pricing the blood because our, our desire isn't to make a big profit. We're a nonprofit. Um, but it does cost money to go from the vein to the hospital. It's roughly about $200 a unit. Um, and so it's uh, quite a process. We have just the phlebotomists we have. We have about 11,000 phlebotomists drawing blood. So um, it's a complex operation. It's not as simple as you would think. And we have a lot of medical doctors, a lot of, uh, a lot of moving parts. But it's a great question. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a Friday forum with Gail McGovern, CEO of the American Red Cross. Thank you, Ms. McGovern. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned. <laughs>